All right, guys, back from vacation. No introduction needed. Let's just get right into the story. I needed some time to decompress. I'm back. Let's hit it full throttle. So there's not really words that can describe how scary the situation that I was in at Setanella was. I mean, by far, I've been in some, some bad situations in prison. This was the worst. This whole string of orientation at Sentinella, from getting off the bus and essentially having a target on me to being in the worst riot I'd ever been in. I mean, that first riot, to this day, I'm traumatized. If I'm taking a shit and a fart comes out too aggressively, if it's just like, I'm like, oh, I feel like a percussion grenade went off. I'll like hit the floor. That, that doesn't happen. That's, that would be, that's an exaggeration. But seriously, I do have PTSD. You know, I'll be walking. Um, it's most noticeable at night because I have this insomnia that, you know, I never had before. Now people will call insomnia a lot of things. You know, I always had trouble sleeping when I was a kid. My parents had cable and you may not know this if your parents didn't, but at around midnight, it turns into softcore pornography and I'd always jerk off. When I, when I was of the age where I could do that, we're talking, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, beat off. And this is how sleazy I was at that age. I'd jerk off and then I'd put Nick at night on. Because like in my mind, this is like, I was already some fucking sophisticated criminal back then. I was like, all right, I'll come and I'll put Nick at night on. My parents are not going to think I'm on some weirdo shit if they walk in at 5 a.m. and Mary Tyler Moore's on. It's back when they used to show old classic shows like that. Now they show like Fresh Prince, which is okay, but I don't, what's, what's the point of this? I always had trouble sleeping, but when I got out of prison the first time, I had like legitimate P, uh, insomnia, you know, and that's PTSD based. I didn't realize that because nobody tells you that, you know, they, we don't even take care of our war veterans. You think they care about a convict? Ooh, you saw people get stabbed in prison. We don't care about you. We don't even care about the guy that got his legs blown off trying to defend the country. You think they care about a convict? They don't give a shit. So nobody really addresses PTSD. And that's what June Gloom's about. It's like unaddressed PTSD for convicts because something I feel isn't talked about enough. But I had insomnia like legitimate to the point where I would stay up two, three nights in a row and then I'd crash. If you're a crystal meth user, you are probably aware of the phenomenon where you'll be showering this is after you've been up for a few days. You're showering and then you just wake up with your head on the drain and you're like, oh, and you have no idea where you are. Now, that's freaky when you're up on meth for a few days, but when you're sober, it's even worse. You know, you become, I don't know, like your you, your body just goes out on you. And that can lead to some really dire psychological side effects. I think that's what happened to me when I had that breakdown. Because I wasn't on drugs back then. I just was acting like I was, but I really wasn't. And people to this day are like, come on, man, I've seen the footage. You were on meth. I wasn't. I would say it. I really have no problem admitting stuff after the fact. In the moment, I'll deny, deny, deny. But after, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that was on meth. But I wasn't that time. So I noticed the first time I got out, I had the, the insomnia thing where I would stay up two, three days. You know, and that was definitely from just being wounded from seeing a bunch of violent shit, you know? And then, you know, there's the bravado thing with prison. So if you like try to tell your convict friends, you're like, yeah, man, prison really messed me up. They're like, shut up, bitch. And you're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm on speed. They're like, yeah, that's right. Fuck yeah. Kids are stupid. Let's just get some whores and go to a Motel 6. And you're like, yeah. You're cool. And that's really what most ex-cons are like, unfortunately. That was the first time was the insomnia. The second time, much more noticeable. Jeff notices it when we're walking at night. I've talked about it before. And I see anybody that looks even slightly unsavory. The guy with the Stussy shirt. I'm like, dude's a killer. Jeff's like, what are you talking about? The guy's like 16. I'm like, Get down! He's like, what? I'm like, he's like, dude, are you okay? And I'm not joking when I say this. I have these traumatic flashbacks 
and I go back to this place where everything is precarious and unsafe. And a lot of that comes from the period that I'm talking about right now at Sentinel. Get off that bus. I'm a target. So prison is kind of murky and scary. Murky in a sense where you feel like you're swimming in an ocean and at any moment a great white shark, get it? White pecker woods getting your own people. The great white woods come and they just, they kill you, you know, or stab you. Your own friends, the guys you play checkers with, we've talked about it, king me. Oh man, checkers is fun. And then the next day they're stabbing you. That kind of shit. So you're already paranoid by nature when you get out of prison because your own people get you. Now I'm in a situation like this where not only are my own people trying to get me, but I'm labeled as SMY when I'm, I don't even deserve to be SMY. I never rolled it up. I never went up to a cop and was like, I gotta go. Never told them my case. If I had known this shit, I would have told on all these good dudes that I grew up with. Fuck them all. I would have made stuff up. I'd have been like, dude, Jeff grows peyote. It's a fucking hippie. Arrest that dude. And they'd be like, yeah, 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 fuck Jeff. And then he gets life. I'm like, dude, sorry. Wasn't trying to do three with half, bro. 18 months is a long time. He's like, you son of a bitch. But you know what? I'm practicing yoga and I've transcended anger. And I love you. And it's okay in here. I'm free in my mind. Shut up with that hippie shit, Jeff. I'm sorry. I love you. Maybe you'll never see this. Oh, shit. This one's going on YouTube, so you probably will. So anyway, so... I'm in this situation where there, there's a target on me. Okay, I get off the bus. Cop tells me, are you ready to die? Felt like I was in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre sequel. It was like that. Some redneck telling me shit like that. I'm in some dusty, desolate town right on the border of Mexico. And then there's this brutal riot. Brutal. It was crazy. It felt like I was in a graphic novel or something. Some medieval shit. And then we go back to our son. We're like, oh, we'll be all right. <laughs> it's probably a one-time thing. And then it happens again that night. Saving thing is that those skinheads were nice to us. And they were GP and we were SMY. I, like I said, I, what the fuck? I didn't even deserve to be SMY. You know? There were multiple times I'd have to go in the cell and I'd lift my pants up. And, well, I still had it. It wasn't anything impressive, but I still had one. I was like, what the fuck? Looks GP to me, man. My cell would be like, I know, bro. Looks can be deceiving. Okay, so after all that shit, then we go to Chow, and we see this skinhead walking by. i never even seen this guy before. He looks at me, probably sees the shark tattoo, probably in his mind, he's it's like, fuck that. Guy's got color work. If he beats me up, he might try to suck my dick or something. He's not trying to do that. And then he goes up to the oldest, most feeble, decrepit old man, takes off on him. Guy falls. He starts stomping him out brutally. This is brutal shit. And the cops do not. I mean, it is the most half-hearted, laughable attempt to stop a fucking beatdown I've ever seen in my life. Halt! It's like some 1950s traffic cop or something. It was ridiculous. Halt! Stop! Stop fighting! But they just let him keep stomping this dude's fucking head in. Ah! Ah! It keeps falling. There's like a hundred things that just fell out of my pockets. There's blood puddling out of this guy's head. And then, after all of that, they zip tie both of them, not together. That'd be funny though. Well, now you guys have to be zip tied together and make them do. What is it? You know, that, like at the old fairs where they like tie your ankles together and you have to like hobble. Imagine if they did that. Some I don't know. I'm not sure where I was going with that one. Then they spray the old guy after he gets beat up. <laughs> That's for losing, bitch. It was ridiculous i felt like i was watching some old like i don't know some old like you know vietnam 
war footage or something. It looked like that. It was brutal. Then after all that, Captain comes in. He's like, I'm sick of this shit, boys. I'm sick of this. Huh? You think you're tough? Well, here's a freebie. We're locking you boys in here. And you're going to handle it. And then I don't ever want this to happen again. And then he left. With all the other cops. I don't think I've ever been in a period of my life where I wanted a police presence more than in that fucking moment right there. Because I was petrified. I don't know how many people are in that room. 40, 50. A lot. I didn't even know who was considered SNY and who was considered GP. That's how ass backwards the system was at that period. And I heard they stopped doing that recently because people were getting murdered. Remember? Heads on a mop stick, all that. What do they expect? Mix PC with G. It's insane. I mean, this is my first state experience. So the cops leave. We're sitting in this chow hall and aching silence. I can hear other people's hearts beating. That's how, that's how qu quiet it is. Like some overweight guy, his heart beats like having respiratory problems. It's like, <gasps> I'm looking at him. I'm like, all right. If it cracks off, I'm going to take off on that guy. He looks like he can't fight. And he's looking at me. He's probably thinking the same shit. Everybody's looking at each other like that, you know, and there's this thing when you're in prison, anybody that's done time, shit, even in county jail, if you've done enough county time, you probably know. There's this thing where everyone sizes each other up, you know, like, okay, if you're a woman and you bend over and you have cleavage, you know, a guy's looking at your tits. I don't even try to hide that I'm not anymore. I'm just like, five. You know what? All right. I'm doing this right now. Fill it. And they take like a pink pepper spray thing out of their purse and just spray you. Psst, weirdo. And you're like, ah. It's the same thing with men in prison. But you're sizing each other up and it's not to fuck them. You know, you're not looking at some guy and you're like, damn. Trying to fuck that black fool right there. <sighs> Tall as fuck. Whew. Love tall black guys. It's not like that. You're looking at him, thinking about what's going to happen if some shit cracks off. It's the sizing thing. You see this a lot in prison, in jail. And once in a while, there's a gay paisa that probably is sizing up because he wants to butt fuck or something. But that's few and far between. At least I think. I don't know. I mean, I'm only one guy. I've never done that. Unless I've been up for half a day. On Wellbutrin. So anyway... Silence, chow hall. Nobody's eating either, which is not a good sign, you know? And it's one of those moments in your life where time goes really, really slow. That can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. I'm sure there's period in your life where you're getting laid and you're like, man, this is cool. This is really, really cool. You're like talking to yourself. You're almost like providing commentary because you're trying to savor the moment. There's also moments in your life where you're thinking, this is not cool. This is probably the furthest fucking thing from cool. I'm probably going to die. That's what I felt right then. And I think that's how everybody felt because nobody was eating. You're just kind of seeing people twirling their sporks and their pasta or whatever, spaghetti or whatever the fuck they feed you. Soy spaghetti. This goes on for two minutes. Couple people are smiling awkwardly, you know? That's a common response in a high tense, uh, high tension situation like that. People smile just because it's a weird natural defense mechanism. You know how, like, I don't know, I've heard other people mention this before, but when my dad used to yell at me, I'd start laughing, you know, because he looked ridiculous. Oh, you fucking punk ass little fucking child i'm like dad i'm 27 you child and i you know and i, I just start laughing oh and then you know and then of course it makes your dad met more mad 
And I've heard that other people do that too. So it's the same kind of concept. You're seeing a lot of people sitting there surveying the room, smiling. Probably the three or four gay pices in the building. I'm probably thinking about, you know, they're sizing up for a BFing or whatever. This goes on and on and on. Now, you're literally tensing up because you know at any minute you have to kind of be fluid and you have to spring up and you just have to take off on someone. We knew that there were other knives there too. You know, it's not so much that I'm scared of getting beat up. That's, I've been beat up, you know? And once you've been beat up once or twice, it's kind of like, I mean, how much worse can it get? And then, of course, you get beat up that one time and you're like, oh, fuck, that's how bad it can get. Your jaws like unhinged. You're like, ah. But stabbing, that's the kind of thing that you might not walk away from. You know, I've met a lot of guys that are partially paralyzed because they were stabbed in prison. Generally don't die from getting stabbed in prison, but you get worse stuff. You know, you get, um, you'll like lose feeling in part of your face. I've seen that quite a bit. Uh, I've seen people get their throat slit and they lo lose their vocal cord, you know. Um, I've seen gay Pisces cut off a dick and then keep it so they can suck it whenever they want. Portable dicks. No, I haven't seen them. Probably exist them. And then, out of nowhere, the door opens. The captain comes and he calls us a bunch of pussies. He goes, that's what I thought. You guys are a bunch of pussies. And of course, everyone's just kind of like, relieved. You know, I think that a lot of that had to do with the fact this particular group of people had made the resolve that they wanted to go home. You know, not everybody in prison's a piece of shit. There's a lot of good people in prison. I've met a lot of good people that have made stupid decisions, including myself. And I don't think I was ever a bad person. You know, perverted in like a standard way, Not, nothing weird. I've never seen like an animal and been like, I wanna f fucking have sex with that animal. Nothing like that. Drug addicted, yes. Mentally ill, yes. Bad person, no. Bad people are people that hurt children, people that rape women, people that rape men. I'll include that on the list, that's not cool. Um, People that murder, people that are arbitrarily violent, Stuff like that, right? When you're drug addicted and you do some sketchy shit to sustain your addiction, I think it's an illness. It's my personal opinion. I have a good heart. I still have a lot of friends that I've had throughout all these years. I think that's a telling sign. At least that's what I tell myself. Every time I'm like, yeah, you're, <laughs> you're a piece of shit. Then I think of stuff like that, you know? I've remained friends with a lot of these guys. So anyway, we're all really relieved. You know, and the guys that we're with are a relatively good group of people. The GP, good guys, SMY, I don't know enough about SMY at this point. I don't really know what their situation is. Of course, I've been programmed to think that anybody that's on that side is bad. Come to find out that there's a lot of people on SMY, it's the complete opposite. They're over being a convict, and that's that. So they take us, you know, back through the yard, back to our cells. The relief is palpable, you know, and you think that that's the end of it. It's certainly not the end of it. No, 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 no. It gets fucking horrible, of course. So this is what happens. The next day, in the morning, Dirty goes to chow, right? And, or, uh, he goes to commissary, you know, and they take you out of the cell and they let you go shop by yourself. So I forget what he had on his books. I think he had like $200 on his books. Whatever it was, it was like a decent amount. Comes back with these laundry sacks full of food. And he goes, listen, we're just not going to go to chow anymore. You know, because another busload of people had come in in the middle of the night. We didn't know who was who. Now we had chow. There was no reason to go. Later that day, um, they called him to go to the one yard. And I was like, dude, you can't leave me. It's like, man, 
You know, I gotta go. And I might be fucking up the chronology of this a bit. Um, I don't really remember. But what I do know is that he got about $200 with the commissary right before he went to the one yard. And he left me, so I was there by myself. A new busload of people had come in. Before he left, that wedding ring that he had, that was worth about $500. He was like, listen, bro, I feel bad that I'm leaving you. I was planning on selling this ring so I could get set up here. You know, I'm going to sell this and uh, whatever I get for it, I'll just leave to you. And if you make it to the one yard, you make it to the one yard, you know, if not, just consider it a gift. That's a good guy right there. You know, I, I have him. I'm friends with him on Facebook. Um, I talk to him here and there. I should talk to him more. Um, I'll try to get him to come on as a guest so he can tell these stories from his point of view. But um, he ends up, you know, because we have access to the guys that are the SMY three yard or whatever. So he tells Chewy, and remember Chewy, he's like, hey guys, uh, I don't do nothing like that. Nah, I don't do that. Uh -uh. He was just like Taco, but a creepier, probably child predator, murderer type version of him. Dirty shows him the ring. He goes, hey, I got this ring. Um, it's worth 500. What can you get for it? Chewy comes back with $50 worth of store. He's like, I'll give you this. Dirty's like, whatever. He ends up leaving me all of his commissary he brought i think the only thing he kept was like some shampoo that he used his body wash because he's bald sorry dirty i love you dog some soap but all the food stuff he left and before he left he taught me how to make some food stuff that i could live off of and what it was was top ramen sriracha sauce beans rice and like a handful of tortilla chips. And that was, that was a meal. And that was what I ate every single meal. So, you know, he hugs me and I'm, I'm legitimately like when he's leaving, I'm, I'm petrified because now I know, you know, that I'm going to have to deal with this whole situation without him. Now, they, you know, Dirty's a big boy, you know, I'll post a picture of him. He's a big guy, bald, blasted whole you know he looks like a straight convict not saying the tattoos make you some hard guy or anything but he certainly didn't look like a, he was intimidating looking right and that's important when you're in a war with other people because what we're talking about save a couple gay pieces guys will size you up and they will assess what the threat level is right so having him as a celly you know, and I'm not huge, but like, you know, I'm like a stocky white guy. I, I'm covered in prison ink. I got, you know, like tattoos on my legs and you can tell I'm a convict, you know, and I'm not saying that that makes you tough, but it definitely gives people pause when they can tell that you've been around the block and that you've done time. Because usually if you've done a lot of time, you know how to fight or you've been in riots, or you've been in situations like this. And, you know, they, they think twice about just taking off on you like that. So he leaves. I'm I'm super scared. I'm super sad. Um, I don't like being alone anyway. And I've spent a lot of time by myself in solitary confinement in the hole in isolation like this. But I'd never been in a situation where I had to leave to feed myself. Now, I probably had about $250 worth of food. You know, um, so I just planned on staying in the cell by myself. And that was that, you know. Now, while you're in orientation, you're supposed to get a phone call once a month. To get the phone call, you have to leave the cell. And you're like, you're in one of those classic, what is it, like a 270 room where there's like, you know, there's tiers on the top, there's tiers on the bottom, and there's like, sh there's individual showers in each corner. They would let you out to shower and to use the phone when it was your day to do so. So they'd only let like a few people out at, at a time. Problem was, is when you got out to take a shower, when you got out to use the phone, you know, they'd let like four or five cells open at the same time. And you're mixed with the GP guys that are gunning for you. I had already made 
you know, for showers, we'd already refused showers a number of times. And what we would do is what's called a bird bath. You know, um, bird baths are more common in state prison than they are in federal prison, although people do them in federal prison. What a bird bath is, is basically you find the way that those metallic sinks work is you press a button and water comes out, you know, it, it goes down. So it's hard to wash yourself unless you can get like a little tube, stick it in the, um, you know, in the faucet, and then you kind of like loop it up so that the water stream kind of like, you know, arches out like this, right? And usually these little tubes that you use to do um, a bird bath are grandfathered down. So Chewy have been like, hey, you fellas interested in a bird bath? And Dirty's just like, yeah, man. And like, I didn't even know what they were talking about. I thought they were like negotiating some sexual thing. This is when Dirty was still with me, I'm saying. He had gotten this little tube. So what you do is you stick the tube in the sink, you press the button, you have to press it periodically because it's like on a timer system. And then this little stream of water comes out and you can wash yourself, you know? And like when you're a convict, like Dirty and I, like, you know, sometimes people like put sheet up and get all like private. We didn't give a fuck, you know? I'm like arched down washing my butthole. I'm like, you know, spreading my butt cheeks, letting this like very soothing little stream tickle my butthole. And I'm just kind of scrubbing and like, you know, Dirty and I are just having a full-blown conversation about like random shit. You know, I'm like, you know, I don't really like Beverly Hills Cop 2. Three was cool, though. He's like, which one's that? I'm like, the one um, when they're at the, hey, can you pass me the uh, the body wash? He's like, yeah. He's like, which one? I'm like, the one where, you know, they're at the fair. Yeah, that one's kind of lame. You're lame, dude. What's up, then? Oh, hold on. Let me finish, dude. This is my favorite part. Can I have some privacy? I swear to God, you like this. And he's like sitting cross-legged on his bunk, like reading some James Patterson novel. Yeah, it gets weird, you know. But I think that that's just kind of a testament to how comfortable you are with nudity and with being around other men naked. Like, I don't give a fuck, you know, I'd always be one of those kids that would go to, you know, like the gym, go to like 24 hour fitness and I go in the sauna and there's always like some, a couple naked guys, just butt ass naked in the sauna. And I'd always be like, ew, I'd say it out loud. They'd be like, what? I'm like, that's just like, what the fuck? Put a towel on. Now I'm the guy that's naked. You know, I have like cucumbers on my eyelids. I'm like what? You know, people think I'm like European or something because I'm just so weird. I'm just sitting there butt naked. And that's, that's real shit. I don't care about being naked anymore. I just don't care. Who cares? You know how many men I've been naked around? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. So after he left, I'm just kind of sitting in there. I don't have a radio. You know, they, it, supposedly they're supposed to bring you books from the library. There's like a book guy and he's like this, like very elusive, you know, almost like a Where's Waldo character. You know, they, you, you, Chewy, what's up, man? Can I get a book? He's like, you got to talk to the book guy, man. I'm like, who the fuck's the book guy? The Asian. And then he'd like point to him and you just see like this blur of movement, like go down the tier. So I never, so I didn't even have a book or anything, you know? Uh, and if I did, it was like the same shit. I did, I, the girl with the dragon tattoo, I'd just read it over and over and over again. So mostly I was there, you know, with my thoughts. Thankfully, Karina and my parents started writing me letters right away. So I started getting letters from them. And mail was behind there. But it was just so nice to get letters from Karina. And just, she was always really good about that. She wrote me a lot. She sent me pictures. She knew what was up. Karina was... She's Mexican. She's like programmed to do time. Sorry, that was racist. Honey, I just called you Mexican. She's like, what? Just kidding. I'm recording a video. All right, anyway, sorry. Do it. She, she'll watch this later and she'll laugh about that. All right, anyway, so... um. I knew that I was going to be getting a phone call. And what had happened is that other bus had come in, I think the night before Dirty left. I think it came in in the middle of the night. And once again, it was a group of super serio Southsiders. You know, you could tell that they were not happy to be there. 
You know, you, you'd hear them yelling through the vents because that's how people communicate when you're in a situation like that, when you're in cell living, when you're in the hole, when you're slammed down like that. And we were stuck in our cell. So, you know, you'd hear them say, hey, fool, hey, this is a fucking S and Y yard, dog. Hey, as soon as those doors crack, fucking slit those fools throats, dog. Yeah, fool. Hey, do you have any hyenas I can ride, dog? Yeah, but she's like 440 pounds, fool. Hey, I don't care, dog. Is her face fine? Hey, her face is fucking fine, dog. Hey, don't forget to slit the pieces of shit's throats when we wake up, dog. Oh, all right, dog. Hey, good night, fool. Hey, yeah, I love you, mijo. Hey, I love you too, poppy. And you're like, what the fuck? This is like really the kind of stuff they say. So like you hear through the vents that they were planning on getting off the yard. Now I'm like sitting there and I'm like, meh, you know, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to eat my little bean rice soup and sriracha mix so it really doesn't affect me but i knew that eventually i was gonna have to go make a phone call i was still doing the bird bath thing but there's no way that i wasn't gonna call my baby girl when when i had the chance to you know i missed her i wanted to hear her voice but i knew that when that opportunity came that they'd let me out with a group of other people and there was like a 50 50 chance that i'd even get on that phone you know um since we had been there, there had been so many riots, they hadn't even done that. But Chewy said that they were they were planning on doing it. So, sure enough, a couple days go by. There's incidences, by the way. So, like, the door will crack open for breakfast, and I'll just get up. And it, and it was very nerve-wracking. You know, like, what if I slept in? Because we had heard stories that people would get attacked in their cells. You know, people would have knives, and they didn't want to go get busted for it but maybe they had orders from their big homies as soon as they get to the spot take the knife out run up in a cell and fucking book somebody so you had to you had to remember to jump out of bed and slam the door shut because the door would shut it, it was like on an automatic track so it would open first thing in the morning when you're supposed to go to breakfast but if you went and closed it that's it you know, they didn't reopen it again till dinner. So there was only two times in the entire day that you had to worry about it. So wake up, hear the door crack open. I'd literally like jump out of, you know, I felt like I was in some like 1980s war movie. I, it was like all in slow motion. I'd be like, whoa. And I'd like run and like slam it. Fucking like do a somersault and like jump into my bed. Start reading a book. It was really weird. I don't know. And then I, you know, I'd start talking to myself. Of course, Mandy came back. She's like, hey. I was like, hey, Mandy. It's been a long time. I'm like, yeah, I know. I missed you. She's like, I missed you too, babe. And then you'd hear like AZ, the black dude that was next door, be like, hey, man, who are you talking to? I'm like, uh, no one. It's like, no, I heard you say Mandy. Tell me you got some flicks over there, bro. You know, flicks are like, you know, thong shots and shit. You kind of like regressed a little bit you know i mean i remember being a little kid and jerking off to like my parents victoria's secret catalogs and stuff well my, my mom's not my dad's i don't know my dad did get sports illustrated swimsuit edition but i'd always like steal my mom's victoria's secret and then i'd get in trouble ryan did you steal your mother's victoria's secret catalog i'd be like no dad i didn't and then like they'd raid my room and find like 50 of them ryan i'm like I, uh. yeah yeah, that turned out fun. So, I remember right after I'd slammed the door. This is probably, I want to say this is like the first day when Dirty wasn't with me. I don't know, all these days kind of blurred into each other. But I slammed the door and I got back in bed. You know, I made myself my little sriracha mix or whatever. And of course, I hear the siren. <laughs> And I, you know, I run out to the door and I look and you see all the cops running and it became almost normal. Like if that didn't happen, you thought something was up. It was like every single time these guys would go to chow, something would happen. And I'm looking like in my locker, just stacked with chili ramens, got a few bags of chips, a couple full things of sriracha, but I'm eating this shit three, four, five times a day. It's getting old and I'm starting to, you know, kind of trip a little bit. Like what happens when I run out of food? Eventually I'm going to have to go. 
And without having like a partner in crime, without having somebody like Dirty to go to chow with, it's an entirely different, scary thing. So one day, I don't know, this is probably like three or four days later, I'm like on this straight sriracha diet, which by the way, gives you the craziest diarrhea and you're shitting out dragon breath, fire diarrhea, where it's just like, and you're just like assholes singed. Feels like a missile is getting launched out of your butthole or something. It's fucking gnarly. You're not, human beings are not supposed to live off sriracha and chili. That's what they're not supposed to do. I mean, I may not know much, but I do know that. So one day the cop comes by, it's after like a week or so, and he goes, Leon. I go, it's, uh, it's Leone, sir. Leone. Um, yeah. Do you want to use the phone? I'm like, the phone? What's that? Remember that? My old Sally, he was doing like 30 years. And if I mentioned home, he'd look at me all serious and be like, home? What's that? <laughs> it was really funny. His shit used to crack me up. I don't know if that's as funny for you as it was for me, but I used to think it was funny. And so I, I'm like, hell yeah, I want to use the phone. Sign me up. So he signs me up. Right. I don't know when I'm going to get to use. It. I'm like, well, when, when am I going to get to use it? He's like, we'll call you. Can I have a general estimate? He's like, we'll call you, Leon. I'm like, all right. All right. So I'm like sitting in my cell. I'm like doing my hair as if Karina can see me. I'm really excited to talk to her. I mean, I'm, I may joke about a lot of this, but like, I, I look back at that. I'm so sad. I was like, like, you have no idea, that, like, made my whole month. It was, like, the most exciting thing to, that could happen, ever, you know? And, I mean, I just had a kid, too, and I I was, I don't know, just calling home was a big deal. So, finally, they call me down. Well, they don't even call me. The door just opens. And I'm like, I look at it, I'm like, fuck, man. Knowing in my mind that not only am I probably going to get in a fist fight, because this is the first time they'd even let any of us to the phone at all. This is like the first time they'd ever done that. Not only am I probably going to get in a fight, but there's a good chance I'm going to get jumped. Because what are the chances that, plus these guys, it doesn't even, like, they don't even see me go to chow. So they know for sure that I'm just all PC'd up in my fucking cell because I don't want to see anybody. They probably think I'm some, like, Australian sex offender. Chomo from Down Under. I'm trying to do an Australian accent. Anyway, so I, like, go to the door. I kind of look out. Now, there's nobody out there, right? They won't let us out with the three-yard SMY because we're on a three-yard SMY. We're just in the unit. So all those guys are locked in their cell. I kind of look, I see the cops. There's a cop sitting at a station like in the in the middle. I'm thinking, I'm like, all right, well, if I'm getting jumped, I can always run towards that guy and get maced. <laughs> Sad that that's like my lifeline. Well, I can always get maced and then I'll be fine. Man, I don't see any other doors open. Now, there is like a blind, like a, a blind spot. So I can only see diagonally what's below me you know i can't see next to me i can't see this side i can see diagonally i can see what's in front of me and there's like a a, a row of cells and i'm looking and you hear on the pa leon come on man if you want to if you want to call come out well great people didn't know that i was being a pussy before now they all know you know it's like just you may as well make an announcement that leone's a bitch that's pretty much what he did so I'm like, fuck it, you know, my heart's beating fast. I'm like, you know what? Got to talk to my girl. Got to talk to Nico, Karina. I got to do this for them, which, you know, she would have probably preferred if I just stayed in my cell and not put myself in harm's way. But I really wanted to hear her voice. So I get go out of my cell. I go down these stairs. Heart's beating the whole time. Bah, 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 bah. I don't see anyone. Oh. Go right, go right up to the cop station. I'm like, hey man, uh, it's just me. It goes, just you. Ah, <laughs> which phone do I use? 
He's like, that one. It points like, so where the cop station was, there's this whole other section that's like behind this corner. You can't see it from where my cell is and you can't see it from where the cop station is. He goes, over there, a couple phones, you're on phone number three. I'm like, okay. So I go around this corner. See probably the six foot two South Sider. He's on the payphone with like his leg like kicked up on the wall. And he's mean dogging me. I'm like, eh. I guess I'm not alone then, am I? Whatever. I'm just going to go for it. So I walk up to the phone and... I don't remember how the phones work there. I think you just call. I don't even remember. Do you have to use your register? It doesn't matter. I get on the phone and I, I dial Karina's phone number. Now, it's very interesting because I'm very excited to be talking to her. And I'm very excited to be, you know, to hear any updates about Nico and to hear about my parents. But at the same time, I'm absolutely petrified of this like six foot two South Sider that is mad dogging me. Of course, he has face tattoos. Of course, it's the Raiders logo on his cheek. And it's like, doesn't look right. It looks like a fucking nine year old scribbled on it. So it just looks kind of ridiculous. Like you can't even take people seriously like that. You know, it's like some like pancake lopsided Raiders logo. He's like, like mad dogging you. But he looks like some fucking deformed disney character or something i don't know that's not even the right way to describe it so anyway so i call and karina's like oh my god babe are you okay i got your letter i heard there's riots cracking off are you good i was like oh yeah i'm like trying to sound all tough i'm like yeah babe just knocking out uh minorities left and right she's like what the fuck and i was like i mean yeah no i'm good how are you? And then I get all soft. I'm like, I miss you. And she's like, I miss you too. And so we start talking. Now this whole time I'm looking at this guy, right? Like I'm trying to like play cool, kind of like roll my sleeve up a little bit so you can see like part of the fear and loathing cover. Not the whole thing. I don't want him to see that I have a tattoo of Johnny Depp on my fucking arm. So Karina and I are talking. I'm like, how's Nico? She's like, he's so fucking wonderful. You know, he's crying a lot. We miss you. We miss you so much. Da, da, da. So we're talking. I'm looking at this guy. This guy is getting increasingly more angry. You know, and he's talking shit in Spanish. Fat. I don't know. That's probably not good fast Spanish, but you get the idea. It's obvious to me that he is having a fight with somebody on the phone. Now, let me tell you something about that. A little time out real quick before we get to what happens with this fuck. Remember the skinhead that had come in and taken off on the old guy? This is what happened to him. So Chewy came, he's like, hey man, I got an update on the guy that did beat up Twitch. Twitch is the old guy that he had beaten up. The guy that got maced after he got beat up. I wonder if I can track that guy down. Be interesting to hear that story from him. But anyway, note to self. What we had heard and what Chewie had told us is that that kid, the skinhead, he had been at the he had been at Sentinella for a couple weeks. I'd never seen him for some reason, but I guess that's not surprising that I don't remember every single person that was there and I didn't go to Chow some of the time. But what had happened is he had decided that he was going to stay and program with us. He was GP skinhead, right? He was going to stay and he was going to program with the PC, do the integration thing, get 33% off. He had gotten a phone call to his girlfriend or his fiance or whatever, probably some hood rat bitch, right? No, I mean, well, you know, I mean, skinheads, come on guys. You know what skinheads look like? They look like a fucking Mortal Kombat character or something. It's ridiculous. I, I'm not a fan of skinheads. You can probably tell. So he called her and not only did she break up with him, but she was fucking this dude's dad. <laughs> dad. I don't know how old he was. That's all I heard was dad. Who knows? Chewy the sex offender could have been just making up that weird sort of detail like that. But that's what it, that's what I was told is that 
this skinhead dude called his fiance. She broke up with them and she's like, I'm fucking your dad. And he's like, what? And so he got off the phone. So he decided to, he's like, I'm going to get off this yard. You know, he decided to take his anger out. Well, I'm going to take off on a PC. Well, the problem is the guy had been at the yard for two weeks already. You can't do that. You can't just decide, up. Oh. no, I'm in the mood to be solid right now. Fuck that. I can't be here. And then just go take off on some old guy. It doesn't work like that. So what he did is he went and he took off on Twitch, stomped on him ended up getting maced and he ended up getting taken off that yard. Now remember, you had to beat up someone twice to get off unless it was that brutal where you're stomping someone's face in like that. You know, I think he even got charged. I don't even remember. But what had happened is they took him from orientation to the foreyard on Sentinella. Now, I don't watch, I don't watch, I don't wet, I don't Wes watch. I don't watch Wes Watson, but I do subscribe to his channel and, and every prison channel that I can just to support these guys, you know, um, just to get their subscriber count on. I don't know. I support anybody that, uh, you know, that's been to prison and is trying to make something out of their life. And I saw a video recently, or at least I saw the thumbnail that said that Sentinella Foreyard was like the worst, most violent prison in the California state system. I'd say that that's accurate from what I've heard and from what I've seen. So what had happened with the skinhead is he got taken from the SMY3 that he was on orientation because he was supposed to go to the one yard. And because he had stomped this guy out, they put him on Sentinella's four yard, which is A, so GPA. He went there, he tried to show his paperwork like, hey, I was. they tried to put me on the shard, I tried to get off, and now they put me here. This is the problem with that. On his paperwork, the cops knew that he was going to try to pull that. And the cops were pissed about this for some reason. So they put it on the paperwork. What time period he had been on orientation. So it clearly said that he had been on the shard for two weeks. Well, that's a little longer than 72 hours. And what happened and what Chewy said and what we, we later got confirmation is true is he went to Chow right after he got there. He showed his paperwork to, you know, his unit rep or whatever. He went to Chow and they whacked him in the Chow hall. He got murdered. He got killed. He died over it. That skinhead that stomped out Twitch got murdered over not getting off that yard in the... Whatever. The time that he was allowed the, the the time that was allotted for him to be on that yard got killed over it killed murdered got stabbed to death in a chow okay so anyway so chewy had told me that so now i'm on the phone with my girl so and the reason that i took a little departure right there and went off on that side story is to let you know that this is what chewy had told me a guy had a bad phone call and then went and tried to beat up an old PC guy, ended up getting murdered over it. And now I'm sitting on the phone talking to my girl I hadn't talked to in I don't, God knows how long. And I'm watching this big buff. Hey, dog, that fool's buff as fuck, fool. Fucking buff and bomb. Bomb and buff. Big old buff Southsider. Talking shit in Spanish. He's obviously probably talking to his, his Haina or whatever, right? So Karina's talking to me, but it's like kind of being drowned out by my own thought process because I'm thinking about, well, this guy's probably going to kill me. If he makes any sudden movements, I will hang the phone. I got to go, babe. I love you. Hang up and run right towards the cop station because I'm not going to let this big, massive beast of a Southsider get me. Karina's talking to me and I'm, I'm like, I love you too. I see him hang up the phone and he kind of like starts walking away. So I'm kind of like starting to loosen up a little bit. I'm like, all right, this guy's probably not going to do anything. So I'm talking to Karina. It's like, I love you so much, baby. It's like, I love you too. And you know, we're just having our little fucking faggy love drunk phone call or whatever. He's walking like towards the cop station, takes a step, looks at me, we make eye contact, I'm like, I'm like, honey, this, 
Southsider's looking at me. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, uh, if I have to go suddenly, it's because I gotta go. And she's like, huh? And he just starts running towards me. I was like, I love you, babe. Hang up. Exactly the fucking way I had planned it in my mind, mind you. And so this guy's running towards me. This big old man. I don't know if he's 6'2", but he's some tall Southsider. Buff, too. Bombing buff, dog. He starts running towards me. So I'm like, kind of like, I'm like, all right, well, there's only one of them. I don't know if he has a knife or anything, but I'm kind of like juking a little bit. You know, he's like, we're squaring up pretty much. He has the advantage because he's running towards me. That little split second where I said, I love you and I got to go when I hang the phone call up and Karina was here, I'd like bring her in here. She's upstairs, but if she was right here, I'd like have her tell her version of this from when she was on the phone. Maybe I'll still do that. We'll do a video soon. So he runs towards me, I kind of juke, right? Cops do not even see that this is going on because we're in a blind corner. The only people that can see is the SMY3 because they're all in their cells. And like there's people that just kind of stand at their door all day, probably beating off because a bunch of SMY three yard sex offenders. And they're just kind of watching. So this guy's kind of, you know, chasing me. And I'm kind of thinking, I'm like, should I just go heads up with him? Should I just kind of juke him out? I'm trying to juke him out. That's my first plan. Juking him out a little bit and... I'm trying to like run past him. He's trying to get me. There's fucking rage in this guy's eyes. I'm trying to run back to where the cop station is because they cannot see me. The only people that can see me is, like I said, the guys that are in their cells. So I kind of try to run. Guy gets me, grabs me by the shirt right here and clocks me in the back of the head. Now, I don't curl up in a ball. That's used to be my go to move. I kind of, he's like big enough where I can kind of like lean into him. So he can't really get me. He's just kind of holding me and giving me body shots. I get around and I elbow him, right? I, I connect good, except this is the thing. I connect in a way like I hit like right here. And it's the kind of thing where if you hit your funny bone wrong, your whole arm goes numb. So my arm just gimped out. I couldn't use it anymore, right? But I hit him hard to the point where he kind of like fell down. Now he's like trying to grab onto me and I just start running, right? Now the cop sees us. So now the cops are like, hey, and the siren. And you see the cop run from like the, the upper gate thing. Like there's this like catwalk is what it's called. It's like this walkway where cops can walk with a gun. Now he was in the tower looking at the yard. But as soon as like, I guess the cop hit the deuces or whatever and the sirens, he starts running. Now he... I'm running away from the South Sider. There's cops telling us to stop. There's a siren going off. There's this guy on the catwalk and he has a gun and he's kind of like, you know, just looking at us. He's not pointing the gun at us. South Sider's running after me. I'm running full speed away from him. Like I've, I already elbowed this guy. This guy, if he catches me, is going to kill me. No doubt at all about it. And he's big enough where he's towering over me where I know that he can't. Cops are telling me to stop. I run right past him. I run up the stairs up to my cell. So I'm on the second floor. I run up to my cell and the cop, the guy that has the gun that's on the catwalk, he's the one that has to open the cell. Like he has the button where he can open it. I run up to my cell. My cell door is shut. Southsiders running up the stairs, like these metallic stairs. Cops are telling him to stop. The guy that's holding the gun is saying that he's going to fire. And usually they don't even do that. They just start firing. I get up to my cell. It's closed. I'm like looking at the guy. Guy has the gun. He's not doing anything. Southsider guy is getting close, closer to me. He's getting up to the stairs. Finally, my cell door opens. The guy opened it because he saw that I was trying to get in. I fucking go inside my cell and I just slam the door shut. Southsider comes right up to my window and he's just screaming shit in Spanish that I don't even understand. It's like, that's horrible Spanish. It's like Russian. He's saying some shit, he, you know, he's like, fucking bitch, you fucking puto bitch. And like, I mean, I'd hit him pretty good, like to the point where my, where my arm, like I couldn't even really use it. Like that's how bad, that's how hard I hit it. Like my funny bone had been hit to the point where I, like my hand was completely numb. Now he's just, he's just like yelling at me. And then I just see him get pulled away from me. And he's just staring. And it's like watching like a, shark recoil back into the water or something i'm just seeing the soulless black eyes of a south sider i'm just like jesus fucking christ that was close i was honestly not the beginning but pretty close to the beginning because 
this nightmare at Sentinel orientation is far from over. That's the first time I try to use the phone. That's not even the worst time. I barely escaped. And let's just say that it got, it got worse for me. And we'll get into what happened in the next installment of my <laughs> wonderfully amazing life in the next state prison installment. Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you. Stay in school. Don't do drugs. Don't go to Centinella. Palabra.